And um, just as we get our hearts quiet before the Lord, I know you've heard some wonderful worship uh, this morning, <clears throat> but I'm going to challenge you. We'll just pray for yourself right now that God would speak to your heart. Would you pray for those right around you? You may know their name, you may not, but you pray that God would meet them at their point of need. Pray for those around you that may are just inquirers. They're seekers after God, and they're questioning others that are believers that are questioning things. Lord, I pray that, pray for them also. Father, I pray that you would take the word of God now, apply it to our hearts as we've worshiped you and opened up our heart. I pray now that you would fill it not only with your praise, but also your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, we want to take the Bible this morning. We'll turn to Acts chapter 4. I'm in a series of messages, and what we've, done, what we've done is basically this. We've asked you, not only as a church, but as a community, if you had one question that you would like to ask God, what would it be? And you have responded overwhelmingly. Some of those questions have to do with the subject matter of today, and they've sort of been grouped together. Others are, are really kind of one sentence or two sentence type answers and we're going to be coming to those and at the end of the series I'm going to be throwing some in maybe uh, at the beginning of the message before the message uh, other messages start or maybe on my blog as well and so we're going to try to get to all the questions or at least most of them uh, during the next several months and but in Acts chapter 4 we find um, an interesting passage that points us and implies many different places <clears throat> answering the question why is Christianity so exclusive? And the real question that came out over and over again, why do we feel like we're right and everybody else is wrong? Well, a great question. Here is, um, here is someone's concern. How could there be just one faith? Asked Blair, a 24-year-old woman living in Manhattan, didn't, wasn't uh, connected to us. It's arrogant to say your religion is superior and try to convert everyone else to it. Surely all the religions are equally good and valid <clears throat> for meeting the needs of particular followers. And what she's saying is basically this. How can you claim that Christianity has the only truth? And how can any religion? In fact, one young man from England stretched it out this far. Religious exclusivity is not just narrow, it's dangerous. Religion has led to untold strife, division, conflict. It may be the greatest enemy of peace in the world. If Christians continue to insist that they have the truth, and if other religions do this as well, the world will never know peace. Now, it's interesting that 30 years ago, if you were to ask people the question, what is the greatest threat to peace in the world, they would say it's something political, uh, usually communism, but certainly the political, the, the idea of the political arena would have been the answer. Today, however, you ask that same question of our culture today, and they would say it's religion. And we can see that by the terrorism going on in our world. It's religion. When we disagree on religion, there's strife, there are arguments, there is conflict, and sometimes there is violence. And here today, I'm, I'm just going to share with you this. I'll, I'll give you this, that that is true. There's a lot of truth to that. And to deny that would just simply be denying reality. And so what is the answer to it all? For example, does Christianity really say that we're exclusive, that we're the, the only one? And if so, what is the uniqueness to that Christianity and how do we, we apply it to our life? Um, I'm really opening up to a, a very strange passage for this particular um, message because it's really an historical narrative. It's it's something that's just telling you and telling us what happened during the time that the New Testament church was started. And what has happened here is that uh, the day of Pentecost has come. Jesus has already ascended up into heaven. Jesus, uh, Peter preaches this great sermon. A lot of people receive Christ. Then he's walking, he and John are walking through Jerusalem and they see this man at the temple, outside the temple. And he says, you know, I need, I need some money and he says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I, I give unto thee, stand up and walk. And here's the, 
the man standing up and he's walking. He's healed of being lame. And this opens the door, a platform for Peter's next sermon. And he begins to preach the word. And the Jewish leaders really didn't like it. Same ones that, you know, had Jesus nailed to the cross. And we pick up the story at this point in verse 5. On the next day, after this great sermon, after the healing, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all those who were high pri of high priestly descent. This was the who's who of the Jewish court, the Jewish Sanhedrin. It, I mean, this, this, these were the people. And he says, when they had placed them in the center, meaning the disciples, they begin to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Now, Peter's about to answer, and here's the question I'm going to ask you. I'm going to read these next few verses, and I want you to tell me what is the real controversial verse here, okay? All right, verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man stands here to, before you in good health. He is the, meaning Jesus, Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, by which you became the chief cornerstone. This was not exactly a pep talk to, I mean, to the high priest, you know. You crucified the Lord, you've rejected the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Anybody care to guess what the, sorry, what the controversial verse is? Verse 12, you have won. And we don't have any prizes here today at all. But... Um, JT's going to handle the prize thing, you know, at the end. But anyway, 30 years ago, it was political. Now it's religious. And so what about this claim? It says, no one else. What does that mean? Well, first of all, I want us to look this morning at the exclusivity of all religions and of truth in general, the uniqueness of Christianity, and thirdly, the application to Christianity. First of all, religion does have, as I said, the potential to divide. But Why? Why does it divide? Well, it's more than just being dogmatic. You see, in your religion, as Tim Keller would say in his book, Re Reasons for God, in your religion, what you have is a performance issue. You have a book and you have rules in that book, in your religion. And you must obey those rules. And so there's a performance involved. Now, if you perform better than the next guy, the second step happens. You feel superior to the next guy. And if he also has a different set of beliefs altogether, then he'll never come around to your performance before God. Because of that, there's a separation involved. After all, you do not want to be intellectually or whatever it is, you don't want to be a part of this group because they don't do right. And from there, conflict occurs and sometimes even violence. The truth of the matter is all religions within themselves are exclusive. Uh, the book of uh, the, the Quran with Islam. We're, we're looked upon by some, some of the people in, that, in, in the Quran, certainly, as infidels. And so we are wrong and we are against what they are doing. The Jewish faith is exclusive. They don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah and believe that we're wrong for believing that. The Mormon faith is like that. The Hindu faith. What about the Hindu faith? You say, aha, I got you on that one, Pastor. They are inclusive. Remember the five fingers of God illustration that's so famous among the Hindus? All of it leads, all the religions lead. They may be different, but they all lead to the heart of God. But the truth of the matter is, if you've ever visited India, which I have, you will find out that they're very exclusive. You will not want to be the Christian minister that stands in New Delhi and preaches the word of God on the, in the public square. Because if you do, you, I'm not saying you'll be arrested. No one knows if you'll be arrested because you're gonna be hit, stoned, and beat up and maybe killed for doing that. Why is that? Well, if I have the truth and I'm performing in such a way, I'm afraid of you in a way. I'm afraid of you because you're going to come in and proselytize my children and my grandchildren, and I can't have that. I can't have them believing a false religion, and so it further divides. But every religion, including Hindu religion, 
is very exclusive. And so what does society do? I mean, if you recognize the problem, you've got to do something about it, right? So what does society do? They have three solutions to Christianity and to, um, especially here in America, at least Christianity, but also in the European countries all over the world, a different way of doing things. Number one, they want to kill it. If we can just kill off Christianity, then that will solve all of our problems. So let's kill it off. How do we do that? Through the halls of intellectualism, education. If we educate people enough, they won't believe it anymore. Right now, um, at a major university, in fact, probably all of them, just one that I know of, and as a freshman, you are taught a class. It's really a philosophy class. I'm not sure the name of it. But in that class, as a freshman, you are uh, abruptly confronted with the beliefs that you have always believed all your life, and they, they attack those beliefs. They tear them down. And so if we just kill them, we'll be okay, but it hasn't worked. I'm not saying it hasn't worked among some, but it hasn't worked. Christianity is still flourishing all across the world. Right now, we, you look in Africa, many, many nations in Africa, they're 50% evangelical Christian. South Korea, Everybody would say, yeah, Korean education is really good. Well, 40% of the people in South Korea are professing Christians. And so we see this not working. So number two, control it, communism. If we can just control it, you just keep it in the church and that's all you do. You can't go out into a home. You can't proselytize anyone else. Just keep it in the church. It'll work that way. 1948, our missionaries left the nation of China thinking that it will be in the dark forever and forever. Well, it opened back up to Christian missionaries, at least to some extent, several years ago, and they found out the church through the homes, meeting in the homes, had flourished everywhere. Flourished. And so we look, and there's a third thing that we can do, and that is we just simply limit it. And the idea here is that, yes, you can, you can have your religion but you must keep it out of the public arena. You can keep it private, it's okay, but you've gotta have it coming out of the public arena. In fact, I've, I've heard people even on television through uh, all this political cycle that goes on, somebody got, I think, beat out, um, you know, lost an election to a, another, uh, to a believer, to a Christian. It was a congressman and he got on television and said, how dare these Christians go into the voting booth and bring their religious convictions in the voting booth? Well, then you have to define what religion is really all about. You say, well, that, that's a belief in God, right? Well, you know, some religions don't have a God. You say, well, that, that's belief in supernatural. Many religions have a God, but they don't believe it's a supernatural. There's no miracles going on. Sanhedrin in the Bible, many of the people there were... Uh, uh, believers that were, there, were no, there was no supernatural. And so what is religion? Again, Tim Keller defines it by saying this. It's a set of beliefs that explain what life is all about, who we are, and the most important things in life. Now think about that for just a moment. If our religion is our set of beliefs that explain, as I said last week, the logos, the reason for life, it explains who you are. It explains what you really believe. How in the world can you take those beliefs and your way of life and everything that you're thinking about life and stuff it into a closet? How can you not bring that into the voting booth? How can you not bring that into the public square, the public arena of life? Now, these people that want to limit it say two things. Look, you can believe anything you want to believe. Believe anything you want to believe, but you have to believe two things. Two things, very important. Number one, you have to believe that all religions have good in them. They're valid. Your religion's good for you, my religion's good for me. And, and they're just kind of all different. And one of the things that they bring out in this, um, in this point is the illustration, they like to bring this out, about the elephant and the blind men. And the blind men, if you understand the illustration they use in the business world, the one blind man goes up to the trunk of an elephant, he just feels the trunk and says, oh, an elephant's like a snake. And then another man looks at it and, or rather, feels of the, of the um, side of the elephant, oh, the elephant's like a wall. And a third one 
uh, gets down around the feet of the elephant. And so, you know, really an elephant's like, like a tree. And the atheist would say, or at least the person who says, got to limit our faith in the, out of the public arena, would say, you see, all religions are about, each one of these blind men have a different perspective of the elephant, but none of them have the full, um, um, the arena of, of the entire belief system. Well, what he's saying is really, the elephant is life. It's all of life. And all religions, and everything religion means is in this elephant. And we can only grasp a corner of it. Therefore, all religions are, are valid. They have some truth, some falsehood. We should just all go along to get along. The problem with that, as pointed out um, in his book, let me get the name right, Leslie Newbigin, in his book, The Gospel in a Pluralistic Society, answered this question. He was thinking about it one day and mulling over the question over and over and over again. And he says this, if the elephant represents all of life, and listen very carefully, I'm not sure I can explain it like he does. But if the elephant represents all religions, all of life and what we believe about faith, then the person telling the story that claims that each blind person does not have the whole perspective is claiming to have the whole perspective. Now think about that for just a moment. For somebody to say all religions are valid, then they're saying, I know all religions and I know all about life and I know the answers to life and the meaning to life. And I'm the one looking at the whole elephant and believe me, you don't have it. And so he says it makes the whole idea really an invalid argument. The second thing it says is that religion, so first of all, all religion is valid, but secondly, religion has value privately, but you must keep it out of the public arena because all it causes is arguments. It's a waste of time to argue. It's a waste of time to have conflict in life. But what they're saying is this. What, listen to me very carefully. What they're saying is you can believe anything that you want to believe as long as you believe in the two things that I believe in. First of all, all religion is valid. Second of all, that, uh, you know, we've got to keep it out of the public square, the public arena. Now, if you believe, you're saying that I must believe those things along with you in order to get along with you, in order to get along in the world, what you're saying is not only if you made a doctrinal statement, a statement of religious belief, but you're also claiming that I must believe it. Therefore, you're trying to proselytize me over to your belief. And that's what's happening in our world. It's a different set of beliefs. A belief that says, we've got to get along to go along. We've got to have peace. So therefore, you have to believe these things. And our society, even in a Christian church, oftentimes goes into that. And they're saying to themselves, yes, I believe Christianity. But hey, there are many other things that are valid. Here's the problem. In the Old Testament, you will find all kinds of other religions. We think to ourselves, well, all these religions have come up and all of them are valid. How did God really approach these in the Old Testament? The pro, or, or say the Baal. You know, the Bible says he destroyed thousands of prophets of Baal at one time on Mount Carmel. Fire came down from heaven. What about Asheroth, the fertility goddess that had the temple prostitutes there? What about Moloch who sacrificed their babies on the altar? You say, well, those religions are valid. If we live back in that day, all right, if we, li we were living back in that day, that's what we would be saying today. We would be saying, hey, all this Baal religion is valid. This uh, Asherah, hey, if you want to have temple prostitutes, you just go right ahead. Your religion is just as valid as mine. If you want to sacrifice your babies on the altar and throw them in the fire for Moloch, hey, you go right ahead. That's your religion. Because that's what... We're at, they're asking us to do the same thing that people were asking the Jews to do back in the Old Testament time. And God forbid it for happening. There's always been false religions, always been false gods. So what does the Bible teach? Verse 12, there is no salvation in anyone. That's no one else, no other way. That's what he's saying. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men. That's, that's a wonderful word, given, given. Because over and over again in the Bible, God says, I've given myself, I've given myself, I've given myself, I've given my son. I mean, that, that, has, that has an implication there. 
that Jesus, even though he was born, came from somewhere else before he was born to this earth. Among men by which you must be saved. And that salvation is one place, one agent of salvation. Jesus said it this way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus himself claimed to be the only way to God. So let's look at the uniqueness of Christianity because, I mean, after all, if we claim that, if we claim that, and the Bible says it's very important that we believe that, then what is unique about Christianity? There's really three things. Number one, there's a book, the Bible. Number two, there's a person, Jesus Christ. And number three, there's a, an event, the resurrection of Christ. First of all, there's a book. Right here we find in, in this whole thing that Peter is quoting in verse 22 verse, um, of chapter 3, he quotes Moses of the Old Testament. In verse 11 of chapter 4, he's quoting the Old Testament. He's preaching or teaching people, proclaiming the Word of God. And so he's saying that it, ha <clears throat> that it, has, it has merit. In fact, in 1 Peter, in the book, an epistle that he wrote about doctrinal things, he said that all Scripture is given and inspired by God as people were moved by the Holy Spirit of God to, to worship. Now, there's several different arguments I could give this morning, but I don't have time to get into all of them. I preached about along these lines before. But let me just say that there's a historical argument, there's an archaeological argument, and that those things are important because you want your faith to be validated by facts. You know, there's some religions right now, I can think of one, and they have a, a book that supplements the Bible, and it's a whole new book, it's a book about America, but there are no archeological findings in America that backs up anything that they say in the book, in their, in their book. And you say, well, that's not, a, that's not a open and shut case. No, but you want your, your, your book, your doctrinal statement to be backed up by history and archeological diggings. You know, you look in the Bible. And you go, in fact, you go to Southwestern Seminary right now, they have an entire room in their library full of artifacts that show the Hittites, the Philistines, the Egyptians, all these ancient tribes that are described in the Bible. And so we, we know from there, we find in there that they are, it's, it's valid, it, it, it's historical backing. But the one thing I want to look at this morning is something that's unique to Christianity, unique to the Word of God, the Bible. And that is this, predictive prophecy. No other book in antiquity has predictive prophecy that has come true. None. You look in the Old Testament. The Bible says that Jesus was going to be born. The Messiah was going to be born. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. The Bible says he root out of, a, out of, the, uh, of Jesse. That means he was coming out of Nazareth. The Bible says he will also come out of Egypt. Remember when they escaped to Egypt because they were running from Herod? And the Bible predicts that, that uh, there was a king that's going to come along and kill all the babies because he's trying to kill Jesus. All these prophecies come true. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, is, is in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. In fact, there are thousands, really, of, of prophecies, little bitty things if you count every little thing in the Old Testament, it's fulfilled in the New Testament. You say, yeah, but the writers could have come along and they could have just said, let's see, what, what does Psalm 22 says? Well, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, let me just put that, Matthew says, in my book. Well, if you say that, then you would say that all the New Testament writers were just con people. They were just conning you. Nothing good about that at all. In fact, we, we just have to dismiss the entire New Testament. He said, that's fine with me because I believe in a God of love. You will not find that in any other book in ancient literature except the Bible, particularly the New Testament. You will not find that concept. It's always God has got a judgment, God's got a wrath in other books, in other, um, in, in other books uh, based on their religions. And so here we find Old Testament prophecy fulfilled in the New Testament. Even the resurrection was predicted, by the way. And what about the second coming? Jesus has not come back yet, but we can look at the times and the seasons. We can look at what's going on in our world today. Somebody would ask, well, why don't you ever mention, I do mention it sometimes, what about the killing that took place in Charlotte? What about the bombs in New York the week before that? Because I would be talking about it every week. Every week, it would be something. We understand the times and the seasons. 
Look at what's happening to our economy. And in fact, I'm going to say something here, <clears throat> may make somebody mad. I'm just saying 66% of the people in America feel what I'm about to say. There's 318 million Americans in America. I think you would agree with me. We have some pretty sharp people, loving people, good people. Don't you agree with that? Don't you think America has a bunch of good people? Say amen. amen. Now, with all that, 66% <clears throat> of the people in America say when they vote for the presidency of the United States, they're not voting for somebody. They're voting against the other person. 318 million people, and this is what we have to choose from. Signs of the times. The Bible says you want to, Jesus said you want to know what it's going to look like in the last days. It's going to be like the days of Noah. It's going to be like the days of Lot. That's how it's going to be, Jesus said, when the days of the Son of Man comes again. The Bible says <clears throat> there are going to be earthquakes. Half of the earthquakes have happened in the last hundred years that has ha ever been recorded in, America, in, in the history of the world. Wars and rumors of wars. The Bible talks about the Middle East crisis coming, and the Middle East would be the focal point of life and focal point of the news. The Bible says in the last days, it's going to be the gospel that's going to be spread to every tongue and every tribe in the world, and then the end shall come. For the first time in history, we have a method of doing that. In fact, right now in your hand is a device and sometimes on your wrist. Who would have thought we'd be Dick Tracy's, you know? <clears throat> Some of you don't remember that cartoon, do you? Go look it up. You have a device in your hand right now that you're texting from even as I speak that, <clears throat> that is a miraculous thing as far as human beings are concerned. I remember 20 years ago, 23 years ago, I became pastor here. And within a year or two, Bill Giot came into my office and he said, Pastor, you just got to see this. You just got to see this. I went into his office. He said, you ever heard of the web? <laughs> yeah, a fellow by the name of Al Gore. <laughs> Never mind. Anyway. Um, I mean, he is from Tennessee and y'all won. You know, what can I say? Um, but he says, listen to this. He said, I can go on the web and I can get the baseball scores of last night and I don't even have to buy a newspaper. I said, no, you gotta be kidding. I can't be. And he said, yeah, just listen to this. So he, he said, you gotta dial up this number first. And he goes <laughs> for about 15 minutes. Then it came on and I thought, wow, man, they're, they're, and it happened so fast. <laughs> Who would have thought we had the technology to say, you know, check, check Green Hornet or whatever, you know, and, and, and look at your watch and tell everything, talk to your watch or what? We would have never guessed that. But right now, most of the people in the world can look through the internet or even on television by satellite. And if they want to, they can hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ all over the world. And the unreached people groups that are left, our International Mission Board has targeted those. And they're going into the jungles now and spreading the gospel. And then the Bible says the end shall come. The, the, the Bible predicts all that. You read some of the, the prophecies of that's found in 1 Timothy and se or 2 Timothy. You, you look at some of the prophecies of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. You look at some of the prophecies of the book of Revelation of Matthew 24, and you would think, man, I'm reading, I'm reading today's newspaper if I had a newspaper. I'd be reading today's newspaper. Man, I could, I could look on CNN or Fox News or whatever on the, on the Internet and, and pick up this stuff. Why? Because the Bible is unique. Now, what does the Bible have to say about Jesus? The Bible says in verse 11, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. He says, now you think yourself as builders. He said, you came out and you looked at the chief cornerstone and you said it doesn't fit. That's what builders did. If they looked at a cornerstone, they took out this big, huge boulder. And believe me, there's rocks <clears throat> everywhere in Jerusalem. It's just built out of rock. Got this big boulder and said, hmm, it's not going to fit. It's not going to fit the building that I want to build. 
And that's what the Jewish leaders were saying. Jesus doesn't fit my life. He doesn't fit what I think ought to be in the scripture. So they rejected him. But the Bible says he's been made the chief cornerstone of a whole new faith, a whole new temple being built. And that is not with hands, but the person of the Holy Spirit within our heart. Jesus, it says this about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word of God, the Logos of God, the reason for life we said last week. The Logos of life has become flesh and dwelt among us. <clears throat> Many of you do not remember the movie. And I, I don't suggest it. I, in fact, I've never seen the movie. I've only seen clips and, and, um, and um, partials of it, commercials. But there was a movie out 20-something <clears throat> years ago called Oh God. And it starred George Burns and John Denver. Anybody remember either one of those? Yeah. In, a, in part of the movie, John Denver asked... George Burns, who plays God, he says, is Jesus Christ really your son? Ooh, bold question to be in a comedy movie. And George Burns says, takes a cigar out of his mouth, and he says, yeah, all of them are my sons. Jesus is my son, Muhammad's my son, Buddha's my son. Blasphemous, I'll tell you why. If you would have gone up to Muhammad and said, aren't you the son? I believe you're the son of God. You probably are taking your life into your own hands. Blasphemous. In fact, no other leader in history, of any religion in history, has ever claimed to be a God or the son of God. None. They're prophets. So none have claimed that. But Jesus said in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. The reason he was crucified on the cross, because the Jewish leaders looked at him and said, we don't, we don't crucify for any of those reasons. We crucify you because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. That's the reason he died. And so he either, as Josh McDowell would say in his book, Evidence That a Man's a, a Verdict, either he's a liar, a lunatic, or Lord and God. There's no other options because if he's not telling the truth, if he's lying, we should not follow him. If he's a little crazy, we ought to pity him and try to help him, but we're certainly not going to follow him in a new religion. Him being just a prophet or just a good man because of the statements that he has made about himself in the Bible and also in history is not an option to us. You say, well, yeah, but how do you, how do you know? How do you know? In the event, the resurrection. Now, <clears throat> It says right here in verse 11, he died <clears throat> and then the Nazarene who you crucified, who God raised from the dead, verse 10. <coughs> Suppose you were going to go, ba go back into the past. You had a time machine. I think there's a new television show I saw on uh, previews. I was watching the plethora of college football yesterday. But anyway, there's a new show on, I think, about a time machine. And of course, many of us love the old movies, Back to the Future. So you were going to go back to the future, and you were going to go back, rather, in time, and you were going to warn someone not to do something because it was going to ruin their life. Wouldn't you like to do that? I like science fiction, and so I'd like to do that. How would you prove it? You go up to somebody and say, look, you know, you don't need to make this decision because this is a horrible decision in your life because I'm from the future, and I've already seen it. What is going to be their response to you? Okay, you know, let me make just one phone call. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll straighten this out. Yeah, they're going to think you're nuts. So you, you have to come with some proof. So you make a deal. You got to make the deal. You got to make the deal in advance to really make it work. Got to make a person think. Okay, in my hand I hold an envelope, and it has the scores of every single baseball game that's going to occur tonight, all of them. If these scores... Every single one of the scores, not just who won, but every single one of the scores match perfectly with this piece of paper that's in this envelope. Would you believe I'm from the future? Well, you know that's impossible. 
So you go along and say, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, I believe that. You open up the envelope that night, and every single one of the scores are there, and you think, wow, this guy must be from the future. Well, Jesus did that. He told the, he told the Jewish leaders and his disciples, he said, you tear this temple down, meaning his own body, you tear this temple down in three days, I'm going to raise it up. And the Jewish leaders knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. That's the reason he set, they set the two guards over the tomb after he died and was put in, placed in the tomb. They thought the disciples were going to come and steal the body and a big religion was going to start. They, they made sure, at least they tried to make sure that was going to happen, not going to happen because they understood what he said. Jesus rose from the dead. And there's only two possibilities. Either the disciples stole the body or the, the um, Israelites stole the body, the Jewish leaders. If the Jewish leaders stole the body, why didn't they produce the body? And the disciples did not have access, nor would they die for a belief. All those people died, would have died for a belief they knew was wrong. So there's the proof. There's a Bible. There's a person. There's an event. So how do we reconcile all this in closing? How do we apply it? Verse 19 says in chapter 3, Therefore repent and return, he says in his message, so your sins may be wiped away. If you repent and return, he says, there's going to be something that's going to be beneficial to your life. Your sins are going to be wiped away. As far as the east is from the west, the Bible says, your sins have been forgiven. And there's going to be refreshing in your life in the presence of God in your life. The Bible says this. Here's the truth. The idea to all of Christianity versus anything else is that Christianity is all about God. God is supreme. God is all-powerful. God is the only one worthy to be worshiped. And so what does he do? He saves us on his own. Now, the Bible says, by grace you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of production, not of works. This any person should boast. So when we receive Christ, what are we going to do? We're going to do the minimum. And Jesus said, look, I've done it all. All you got to do is, is take it. Repent and receive. That's all you have to do. And because of that, because of the grace, now my Christianity, real Christianity, is not in the same kind of conflict with other religions of the world. Why is that? Because the, the first step in conflict is saying, I have my set of rules, I'm obeying my set of rules in order to gain favor with God. There are no rules. You receive Christ. Now, there's, there's things that, the way of life that we live after that, but the way we get to God, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. The way we get to God is by pure grace. So, I come to the throne of God, and I say, God, there's nothing I can do. Nothing, I, nothing, nothing I can do to save myself. It doesn't help I was born in a Christian home, if you were. It doesn't help that I belong to a church. It, it doesn't help that, uh, you know, I'm good to my wife and my family. It just, nothing counts. Nothing. It's nothing about production. You died on the cross for my sins, that if I repent of my sins, oh, my life will be refreshed. Now, with that, I'm not going to look down, second step, I'm not going to look down at somebody else because we're all in the same big boat. We're all sinners and separated from God. How can I look down on someone else? You say, oh, that happens all the, all the time in this church and this church. I'm not talking about churches. I'm talking about real Christianity. Real Christianity has humility. Real Christianity says these people, other people need to be saved like I was saved. And so there's not the conflict of physical violence. There's just simply, yes, the proselytizing or proselyting of other people coming into the faith. Why? Because you want them to know the same peace you know. You want them to know the same forgiveness that you know. You want to know them, them to know the same love of God that you have in your life. It's a love conflict, not a violent conflict. And that's why all the other religions of the world describe with the word do, 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 do. You got to do something. Got to do something. Got to do something to please God. And Christianity is the word done. Jesus has already done it all. Now let me close with this uh, little story. Suppose 
there's a plague in the world. And in this plague, everybody is predicted to die from it unless there's a cure. And so the scientists go all throughout America and they try to find someone with pure blood that has not been exposed to the virus and is a certain type of blood, rare, rare form of blood. And they come across your five-year-old son and he's the only one that has this type of blood that is also pure at this time. And they come to your, your doorstep, you're sitting in your living room and they say, look, we need your son's blood in order to make the serum. And they, you look at them and say, hmm, wow, well, we're honored. Um, how much blood are you going to need? And they say, oh, we, we need all of it. Now, wait a minute. What you're saying is you're going to kill my son in order to save the world. Yes, sir. And it's the only way. The only, only way. We need your answer by tomorrow. And so... You pray about it, you and your wife talk about it, you cry about it, you come back the next day, you really don't you feel like you have any alternative, your son's gonna be by himself one day on this earth. And you say, well, let me ask you one more time, is, this the, is there any other alternative, any other way? <clears throat> and you can tell the hesitation on their face. Now, wait a minute, you're not telling me everything. Okay, sir. Just to let you know, there is an African plant that is being developed, and it has cured a lot of people in Africa. And there's a Swiss um, scientist that is also doing a formula for Europe. But we, we as Americans don't have one. And so you can be the American way. You can be the, you can be the Baptist, Methodist, Catholic way. You know? I mean, they have their other ways, and there may be other ways being developed. But we are going to, our pharmaceutical company, the biggest one in America, man, we're going to make a lot of money on this, and we'll share it with you. But it's, the, it's going to be kind of like the American way. What do you think? What are you going to do? Uh, is the first question you're going to ask, well, how much is my share? <laughs> no, you won't. You'll probably, if you're a gun owner... Why, why are you going to react that way? Why are you going to kick these people out of your house? You're going to look at them and say, I cannot believe it. You believe I'm so barbaric and so cruel to offer my son for you to have your American way or your pharmaceutical company can make a lot of money when there are other ways to cure this plague? What kind of person do you think I am? Let me ask you. Do you think God is more barbaric than you? If there had been any other way, why would he com- create, and really it's a Middle East way originally, that became an American way and a European way before that. Why would he create one way of many? And we can see the results, dear friend, of life after life after life after life being changed by the power of God, refreshed, because all we simply did was receive that free gift. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the road to heaven. I'm the only way. No one comes to the Father but through me. And dear friend, the Bible presents the idea, more than the idea, it presents the doctrine, that something that you must believe, that there is no other name under heaven, that you're saved by grace, not by another religion, not by your works, but you are saved by the grace of God as Jesus died on the cross for you, trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone. With heads bowed and eyes closed. I know we live in a world, and you've been taught many, many times over that we must be tolerant of others And we are tolerant of other people's opinions. But we can't acknowledge that those opinions are necessarily right because not everybody's opinion is right. So nobody else moving around, okay? Just just heads bowed, eyes closed. Very important time in the life of someone here. So if you're here today and you're saying, I want Jesus, I want to trust in his way and his way alone, 
as he died on the cross for me, as he rose again, would you pray this prayer with me right now? You can pray it silently as I pray out loud. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross and dying for my sins. I open up the door of my heart. I repent, I turn for my sins. And being the God of my own life, and I turn to you. Help me to grow into the person that you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen.